이어서 두 번째 기조 강연 만나보도록 하겠습니다. 기다리고 계신 분들 많으실 것 같은데요. 굿나 칼슨 ISD 창업자께서 수학의 힘으로 AI 역량 업그레이드라는 주제로 강연을 준비해 주셨습니다. 아마 많은 분들께서 알고 계시겠지만 이 세계 경제 포럼이 차세대 구글로 지목을 했죠. ISD를 창업한 굿나 칼슨 미국 스탠퍼드대 교수님 인공지능의 질을 획기적으로 높일 수 있는 데이터 가공 기술을 세계 최초로 개발한 수학자이십니다. 수학과 함께 AI의 역량을 어떻게 높일 수 있을지 함께 논의해 보시죠. 자. IST 창업자님과 함께 대담을 진행해 주실 분 역시 소개를 드리겠습니다. 금종해 대한 수학 회장님 함께 해 주시겠습니다. 자, 역시 함께 진행이 되는 동안에 궁금한 점들 채팅창에 올려 주시면 저희가 선정을 해서 전달을 드리도록 하겠습니다. 이어서 진행을 부탁드리겠습니다. 회장님 부탁드리겠습니다. 예. 안녕하십니까? 어, 대한 수학 회장 금종해입니다. 저는 현역 수학자이고 현재 고등과학원의 교수로 재직 중입니다. 아마 청중 여러분들 모두 그 4차 산업혁명 시대를 우리가 살고 있다라는 말씀을 많이 들었을 것이고 동감하고 계실 줄로 압니다. 4차 산업혁명이란 용어는 아직 역사학적으로 정의된 용어도 아니지만 인공지능, 사물인터넷 등등 현재 벌어지고 있는 과학기술적, 사회경제적 변화를 거의 혁명적인 변화를 통칭하는 표현이라고 보시면 되겠습니다 지금 벌어지고 있는 코로나 사태 때문에 아마 이 변화는 더 가속화될 것으로 예측이 되고 있고요 이러한 4차 산업혁명 또는 포스트 코로나 시대 대응 전략으로 가장 핵심이 과학기술이라는 점에 대해서는 아무도 이해를 달지 않는 것 같습니다 그 중에 또 핵심이 수학입니다 오늘은 아, 군나 칼슨 교수님이 원래는 순수 수학자였었는데 자기가 전공하는 수학을 이용해서 빅데이터 분석하는 방법을 개발해서 기업체도 세계적으로 유명한 기업체도 만들었고 꽤 많은 사회 공헌을 하고 있습니다. 이 군나 칼슨 교수님의 전공은 간단하게 말씀드리면 위상 수학인데요. 영어로는 토폴로지입니다. 위상 수학이라는 게 위는 위치를 뜻하고 상은 모양을 뜻합니다. 모양상자죠. 기하적 도형을 연구하는 것이라서 크게 보면 기하학의 한 분야라고 할수 있습니다. 현대 기하학이라고 할수 있는데 예를 들면 여러분들이 배웠던 원, 삼각형, 사각형 이런 것들을 많이 배우셨죠. 뭐 구, 정사면체, 뭐 정육면체, 정십면체, 정이십면체 등등 정팔면체 이제 이런 도형들은 중고등학교 때 배우는 도형들인데 위상수학에서는 구와 정사면체가 같은 거라고 봅니다. 원과 삼각형, 사각형이 같은 거라고 봅니다. 좀 상상이 되십니까? 카테고리, 이렇게 바운더리가 하나로 구워져 있고 물론 꺾인 바운더리이기도 하고 구부러진 바운더리이기도 하지만 그래서 어떤 모양을 구분한 어떤 기준을 정하고 그 기준에 따라서 그 모양을 분류하는 학문이라고 할수 있습니다. 아, 그러나 칼슨 교수님은 어, 소개해드린 대로 어, 1973년에 하바드에, 하바드에서 학, 아, 학부를 졸업하셨고 어, 1976년에 스탠포드 대학에서 박사학위를 받으셨고 쭉그 유상수학을 전공하셔서 세계 수학자 대회 초청 강연도 하셨습니다. 그 이후에 어, 이 빅데이터를 분석하는 위상수학적 방법을 적용해서 어, 위상수학에서 다루는 도형은 그 여러분들이 중고등학교 때 봤던 그런 그런 작은 도형들 눈에, 눈에 다 보이는 도형이 아니라 예를 들면 우주의 시공간 같은 4차원 도형도 도형입니다. 우리가 보지도 못하고 만지지도 못하고 전체를 볼 수도 없는 그런 거지만 마찬가지로 빅데이터가 이뤄낸 어떤 모양이 하나의 도형이라고 보고 이 도형의 본질적 성질이 그 데이터의 성질과 관련이 있다는 차원에서 이분은 연구를 시작하신 걸로 봅니다. 아... 제가 너무 말씀 많이 드리면 안 되니까 시간은 짧게 주어져 있어서 아쉽게도 25분밖에 되질 않아서 많은 말씀은 못 듣겠습니다만 칼슨 교수님 2015년에 한국에 오셨습니다. 대한수학회 가을총회에서 초청 강연을 하셨고 그때 제목은 
데이터 어네리스를 위한 위상 수학이었습니다. 아, 칼슨 교수님을 초청해서 어, 강연을 듣도록 하겠습니다. 프로페서 칼슨. Yes. Hi. Do you see me? Do you see my face? Yes, I can hear you. Uh, can you hear me? Do you see me as well? Yes, yes. Yeah, I oh, can hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to speak here. I am uh, really looking forward to, to, to speaking to you all. Uh, I only wish that I could have been there in person, uh, but uh, of course things uh, prevented that from happening. Okay, thank you for joining us today. Uh, yeah. I am Jong Hye Kim, a mathematician, yes. currently a president of Korean Mathematical Society and a professor at the Korea Institute for Advanced Study. Oh, very good. Yeah, I know uh, you visited Korea 2000. Uh, no, no, no. Yes, 2015. The yes. You gave a invited lecture at the general meeting of the Korean Mathematical Society. You remember yeah. the title of the, your talk that time? I, I don't. <laughs> that I, yeah, I mean, I remember it's a topology for data analysis. Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, maybe this is an upgraded version uh, today. Well, today is uh, 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 you you giving a talk to general audience, not only yes. mathematicians. So right. I, I'm sorry, I can give you only 25 minutes, but uh, please give us uh, uh, comprehensive as possible. Yes, I will do. Okay, um, so please shall go I go ahead, ahead and start yes, the presentation yes. then? Okay, so let me let me then share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes, I can see you. See the screen, yeah. Yes. Okay. okay, and so I will then uh, see here, slideshow. Start. Okay, it, so I can it, see it, your slide, yes. Very good. You see it? Slide? Are the slides up? Yes, I can see your slide. Oh, okay. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so again, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. I'm looking forward to talking about it, uh, about these ideas. <clears throat> um, as mentioned, I visited Korea in 2015, and I gave a talk on topology and data science. The thing that we have added and or need to talk more about is the connection of that to artificial intelligence as well, which is a, a very demanding, very important area, uh, intellectual area. Um, so artificial intelligence, it's fundamental to human progress now because we know that we have so many tasks, many of them cognitive tasks, that <clears throat> are simply too big, too complex, too onerous, too difficult to carry out for humans to do. Uh, and, and so uh, we need to be able to address them with uh, automation and augmentation, augmented intelligence, where we, we allow machines to work with humans. The goal is always to improve human well-being. Sometimes we forget that and we think, well, it's about some abstract goal like, uh, you know, profit and so on. But in, ultimately, the goal should be to improve human well-being. So this means that humans must be in the loop. So we can't be talking entirely about artificial intelligence, uh, where one thinks of artificial intelligence as the machines doing everything and humans sitting back. Yeah, in fact, it has to be humans working with machines. Now, what do most people think about when you think about uh, artificial intelligence? You think about <clears throat> tasks that people already know how to do, uh, but, uh, they, but somehow are things that we would like to automate because they are difficult or tiresome to do. So self-driving cars, people already know how to do that. <clears throat> Personal assistants, recognizing images, all those are things that humans can do. <clears throat> where AI is heading is we need to deal with problems that humans really can't deal with effectively, where the data is too complicated for that. And so um, this would be include fraud, uh, cybersecurity, genomics, and so on, where the data is extremely uh, complicated, complex, and where uh, people don't deal with it effectively by looking at it uh, you know, one by one. The data is too large for people to go through. 
So we need to get to the augmented intelligence. And the question is, what are the requirements of augmented intelligence? What, uh, what are the things that, that, that the requirements that are needed? So here are some attributes that I would posit, I would put out there as things that we would want to include. We want to include what I would call unsupervised analysis, the ability to discover. Um, and uh, so uh, that is distinct from uh, what I would call a supervised analysis, where I'm looking to verify a hypothesis that I already have. Discovery can permit me to find the new hypotheses, the things that might actually solve the problem. Um, it also means that we ultimately need to predict uh, because we want to be able to uh, predict the future to some extent, uh, perhaps on the hypotheses that we've generated from the discovery. But now here's the next one. The, the notion that we have to justify is also extremely uh, important. So the idea here is that many of the algorithms, many of, much of the mathematics that goes around data analysis um, is not, uh, not very uh, used to it's not very people are not very used to it and it's not doesn't come with answers for why things happen and if you think about um, medicine if you think about um, financial area uh, uh, if you think about any heavily regulated industry one needs to be able to justify one's predictions as well as to um, uh, as to produce the predictions one needs to be able to act um, uh, to produce actions based on it and also one needs to be able to learn ultimately to learn a model and perhaps to have a model uh, learn as the model changes so uh, as i'm confronted with new data over time i will often have to um, uh, you know to incorporate it in my models and i should be able to do that in uh, hopefully an automatic uh, way now here's one of the problems <laughs> Um, uh, that, that you have a lot of artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, uh, uh, deep learning, which is a very interesting subject, which uh, we thought about quite a bit. Um, you can see here that uh, the problems that often come up is you say, well, uh, you, you know, I need, I need an artificial intelligence application to do something. Uh, but, you know, oftentimes it says, well, I'm going to need to do research for five years and then come up with a model. And maybe that model doesn't even solve the problem. So it's still sort of oftentimes a heavy lift. We can't kind of get to it quickly enough. Uh, and I think uh, it, it means that one needs to be able to analyze and understand the, uh, the data better uh, more quickly. And so, of course, understanding data comes in the area of mathematical modeling. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> one needs to de develop some kind of model to understand the large and complex data sets. And the question is, what does one mean by mathematical model, even just to, to start? Um, I would say that um, oftentimes when we think of mathematical modeling, we think of it purely in terms of algebra. We think of it in terms of equations uh, or things related and called differential equations and so on. We think of it in terms of, uh, of numbers uh, and equations. But what is it that's needed to model complexity? Uh, many times the data is very complex. So think about fraud, think even about genomic data. One needs perhaps something different, something that contains more information and more easily digested information than, um, than are available in algebraic models. And the question to think about here is what does one mean by a model and what do models buy you? What do you gain from having a model? And well, they gain you the possibility of predicting. So if you imagine that uh, you have a model for the weather, it will typically allow you to predict when it's going to rain or when it's going to be sunny. But it also gives you understanding. If you have a model, one can think of it actually in terms of compression. One can think of uh, mathematical modeling as compressing a complex data set in such a way that it retains the features and so that one can actually gain understanding of it. One certainly would like to do prediction, and that is often sort of an automatic procedure. I would say that the understanding is what comes out of, um, uh, you know, more unsupervised analysis and requires a different kind of model. So let me pull you back and remind you of uh, Galileo um, in, in Pisa back in the 1500s, um, worked on, on gravity and, and start, began to understand gravity. He had very simple data sets. They were, there were two variables. There was the height uh, and there was the time. Um, and, and there are two simple variables. And furthermore, 
you can see that they satisfy a very simple uh, algebraic relation. There's actually theory behind this kind of uh, uh, this phenomenon that is very simple, involves a small number of variables, and uh, uh, is, is algebraic in nature. And for the same for Kepler, for example, here, you know, the, the, uh, from some very simple physical principles, one can get to the fact that uh, planets go in elliptical orbits. Um, again, we're talking about a very small number of variables and a very simple system uh, that's described very simply algebraically. And so, so what I would say is that these physics approaches that we're talking about, the algebraic ones, work well in the presence of a very small number of variables. Um, that's certainly one key thing. Well, there, there are certainly systems with large numbers of variables, but oftentimes they are closely related in various ways and can be described in some smaller way. Um, so it also kind of requires what I would call a platonic theory or, a, or a, a, basically a set of small set of relations governing the features in the data, the numbers that are there. So the equations that govern the orbits of uh, planets and the equations that govern the fall of a cannonball from the tower in Pisa. Um, Often, this kind of methodology, though, these physics approaches, as I would call them, don't deal well uh, with complexity. So size versus, we talked about big data. Actually, you know, big data was a very new thing many years ago. It's kind of old fashioned now. We've kind of gone to artificial intelligence instead. Um, but just to emphasize that uh, the, the big isn't the only thing, in fact, it's not the most difficult problem. Complexity is actually the huge obstacle, I would say, that, that, uh, in, in data sets. Their actual size we can usually manage to deal with uh, by sampling or various other aspects. But the fact that the data, the phenomena are complex is what's really uh, important. So it comes in many forms, the complexity does. We need to reduce it in one way or another, and it requires an organizing principle. And I want to say that the organizing principle has to do with what I would call the shape of the data. And so let me go through with you now the notion of uh, the shape of data. So I would say that the very first kind of mathematical modeling that we had, the algebraic modeling, in fact, is for data like this, where a line actually is a very excellent fit. And so the modeling here proceeds by saying um, that uh, I'm going to, to approximate my data by a line. Again, enormous compression involved here. If I, ha I might have 10,000 data points, and if they lie along a line in the plane, I would, uh, they would be parameterized by two numbers, the slope and the y-intercept. And so this is linear regression. And that is what I would call the prototype of algebraic modeling. And when one has that available, when, that is, when the data does fit to that, that is excellent. That is what you want to do. It permits you to, pr to predict and to understand. But sometimes the data looks like this instead. So here, uh, what you can see is that the, the, the governing idea here is that uh, the data breaks into three distinct point, uh, clumps or clusters. Um, and uh, in fact, here what we do is we approximate the data by a shape, but now the shape is actually three distinct points. Um, so this is called cluster analysis. It's a whole other method of modeling. It produces a different output. It produces uh, a division of the data into pieces, and uh, it gives, if you like, a taxonomy of the data. And that is extremely important and can be useful information. Um, and so we might think here, we, uh, uh, mathematicians might say, well, maybe this is really all there is to data. But then we might look at a data set like this one, uh, where, where you see it, it doesn't break into pieces, and it also doesn't fit along a line. It's actually loopy. Instead, it has a loop to it, and so we might model this with circles or a loop. This kind of data appears uh, frequently when one has a time series or a, you know, periodic or recurrent behavior. And now we might say, well, let's go build a loop detector, but uh, maybe we're worried a little bit that we're never going to finish, and in fact, we're not because we might come into data that has this shape instead, shape of a letter Y. So here, this would be, fitted with more of a shape like that. Uh, this kind of data can appear when I have, uh, say I'm gathering uh, data from a, an airplane flying, uh, maybe at altitude in uh, non-turbulent conditions would be at the center, and then I would have three extreme B 
behaviors, namely takeoff, landing, and flying in turbulent conditions. And so I'm convinced that I can't be modeling by choosing, listing all the possible shapes of the data. Instead, I should have a modeling mechanism that can cover all these and every other shape that could arise. And so then we come to the idea of topology, uh, that, which was in, invented or started by uh, Leonard Euler in the, uh, in the 1700s. What he said, he was confronted with a uh, recreational mathematics problem where he was asked, how many times can you, well, can you cross all the seven bridges in the, uh, rib, in, uh, across the river Pregel in the city of Königsberg without crossing any bridge twice? The answer was a no, but the, the way that he solved it was very interesting because he said there's a lot of complex things about this data. There are, you know, the length of the uh, bridges, the, uh, the size of the islands, the, the uh, depth of the river, um, uh, it's the, uh, the breadth of the river, and so on. All of these are uh, complex things that don't affect the solution. All that affects the solution is the simplified network model on the left which we can see here very simply is the two islands are the A and D, and then the, um, the C and the B are the riverbanks, and the, uh, the edges of the network are the bridges. And when he looked at it this way, he could solve the problem easily. So he simplified, stripped away all the complexity, and got to the heart of the problem, which was this uh, network. So topological modeling. Now I'm going to do the same thing for data, where we also want to uh, simplify in the same way that Euler simplified. So topological modeling says you're going to model data by networks or graphs, shapes, if you like. Nodes are collections of data points. That when I'm going to show you some models. Each node is not a single data point, but it's a collection of them. Edges go between nodes that share a data point. It gives kind of a landscape or a Google map for the data, and it's a systematic and sensitive approach to unsupervised learning because it's a model that one can work with and understand. And let me give you some interesting examples here. So uh, at IOSD, we had a number of academic uh, collaborators. Uh, this was a group at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York um, where they were studying uh, type 2 diabetics. So they had been studying people who had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetics. Uh, and the data was rather complicated. It involved both electronic medical records and also genomic information. Um, and, and as you can see, the model really has, it has three groups. Uh, they're connected by some thin wires. But interestingly, what they found was that um, the groups were quite different. So one group uh, was heavily, heavily correlated with cancer. The other two were not. One was heavily correlated with neurological symptoms, and the other was not. So in fact, the understanding that they came out with in their paper was that actually type 2 diabetes isn't a single disease. It's actually several diseases. It's at least three separate ones. And since this was published, they've actually added a fourth model. One of these groups actually split into pieces. Um, this is called stratification of disease. And it's very important for personalized and precision medicine. And just as a very concrete problem, imagine that you're a pharmaceutical company and you're trying to make drugs for, to, to address diabetes. Well, if you have to address all diabetics, that's a problem. Uh, that, that may, you may have a drug that only works on one of the types. If you don't understand the types, you will fail. Uh, and we've actually had examples of exactly this thing happening, where uh, drugs failed. Uh, the, uh, the FDA, the United States Food and Drug Administration, approval. Uh, but uh, once it was recognized that it only works for a subpopulation, they were approved. That's very important to know that kind of information. So stratification is a big step in the direction of uh, precision learning and ultimately uh, automating that process as well, because we want to automate the treatments that you get and uh, allow people to, 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 uh, to work with machines as well. Um, another example here uh, is our, uh, a friend of ours who uh, is a microbiologist at Stanford. He studies infectious disease. And so here, uh, the, the, uh, the, he's trying to model the progression as I go through a flu uh, or I go through malaria. And in this case, what happens is he's, he's measuring um, uh, several things. He's measuring genomic things, but also physiological variables like blood pressure and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and what happens is that the data starts out in a healthy state. And then as the patient moves, they tra uh, traverse a trajectory 
that goes in a loop. Uh, the first part of the loop, you're getting sicker and sicker, and then your immune system uh, goes into action, and you return along a different path going back. It's very important to have this kind of circular model here because it gives you a notion of where you are in the process. You might say that that, that goes on, uh, you know, you could encode that by time. But time by itself doesn't do that because the subjects go through at different rates and it's, it's not a good uh, predictor for it. And so uh, this kind of what we would call an invariant uh, way of understanding where you are in the process by where you are on this, uh, on this loop is actually quite important. Now, when I talked a bit about, um, uh, you, you know, the artificial intelligence, one of the things I said was that we need to understand the phenomenon. We need to get justification for it. So here's a study uh, of uh, breast cancer uh, that was done. This is using genomic information, and this was done uh, some number of years ago. But the finding was that there was a cohort called cohort A down at the bottom where the survival was, ascent, was perfect, in fact, in this cohort. It was about 8% uh, of the, all the patients. Um, and, and I should say the model is not built using any information about survival or actually anything clinical. It all, only uses <coughs> so-called microarray information. Uh, cohort B, on the other hand, has very bad survival. Uh, it's a very difficult prognosis. And cohort C, we didn't understand so well. Now what I'd like to do is I'd like to sort of show you how one can understand this phenomenon. So what that means is building a topological model, not of uh, the cancers themselves, but rather of the features. Uh, so in this case, the features are 1,500 different genes. And each gene for each sample has a number attached to it called the expression level. And so you can build a topological model for the genes. And now you can see here, if you look at cohort A, you can see that it's red on the top and blue on the bottom. Um, you can see that cohort B, which is the bad survival, has that exactly flipped. Um, <clears throat> you know, it's very blue on the top and red on the bottom, except <laughs> there is a red group within the blue, which seems to stay there no matter what you do. I think calls those anchor genes. And then finally, cohort C, you can see it looks more like cohort B than cohort A. So, um, in, in fact, you can see it just looks like a weaker form where the blue region is a little smaller. It does not look much like cohort A. All this kind of thing can give you understanding of what's going on, because now I can say, well, there's a collection of genes that flip, you know, the red genes and the ones that are red and blue, and the first turn to blue and red on the other one. And in the same way, uh, we can also look at the so-called UCSD microbiome, which is studying bacterial subpopulations in the gut. And in this case, uh, healthy people are on that lower left. Uh, and again, this is a model for the different bacterial populations. And so healthy people look that the way as you see in the lower left there with the, the various red areas. On the right is ulcerative colitis, which is a, a nasty, um, you know, a gut disease. Um, and you can see that there's a bright red area there that's circled that simply isn't present uh, in the healthy group. And in the same way, in the upper right, uh, we have Crohn's disease. And there, that also looks much like the healthy people, except it's missing a bright red group that's circled in the lower left. So this is a way that one can take the outputs uh, and topologically model the features so as to get answers about why it is the results that, that you happen are getting. Okay? I, I would want to say the reason for having complex models like this is that in dealing with humans, oftentimes one deals with multiple objective functions. I'm someone, uh, you know, who, if you think particularly about healthcare, uh, think about quality versus length of life. Uh, you know, it may very well be that those two are uh, counter, are, are at, at odds with each other, that sometimes a very long length of life might be less quality. For example, I like to drink beer. <laughs> um, uh, maybe, length, maybe beer shortens my life a little bit, but it increases my quality. Uh, it's different for different individuals, and for that reason, it's very important to have this kind of landscape. One needs a complex model to understand the trade-offs. Um, the other thing I would say is causality. It's very hard to understand cause in a precise mathematical way. I showed you some methods for doing it, but just to give you an indication of the difficulties that can arise, correlation is not causation. Determining causation is often difficult and confusing. 
And Simpson's paradox is a very important problem in this area. And I just thought I would bring this up because it's such a fascinating thing to me, and I would just like to show it to you. Um, this concerns uh, students admitted to the graduate program at University of California at Berkeley. And uh, men were admitted at a 44% rate, and women were permitted at a, admitted at a 35% rate. Now, this looks like there could be discrimination going on here, that men are somehow preferred. But then if you look at all the different departments, so there are departments A, B, C, D, E, and F, you can see that the women actually are admitted at a higher rate in four of those departments. Um, uh, only two of them are the men admitted at a higher rate, and the differences are not very large. You can see they're 37 percent and 28 uh, percent versus 34 and 24. So it really doesn't look like there is much, um, uh, you know, bias or discrimination going on. In fact, <clears throat> the reason for the, the answer is you can see that the men it applied to program A, which has a very high acceptance rate overall, the men applied to that, the 825 of them applied, whereas only 108 women applied to the easy program. The women's, women applied more to the difficult programs with lower acceptance rates. So this just gives you an indication of the sort of questions that one can address, again, with, this, with the topological modeling about uh, causality, which I think is quite important as we go forward with the augmented intelligence. So the conclusions, the shape of the data matters. We need better analysis tools for very complex data. We need better outputs and more flexible analysis for augmented intelligence because people need to be able to interact with the machine, which means you need better uh, user experience and better types of outputs than just simple, you know, predictive numbers. And we need to deal with multiple objectives and causality. So uh, I have hit the end here. I will thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. And so let me now see. Uh, Professor Carlson. Yes, I'm going. Uh, thank you very much for yep. your wonderful lecture. Thank and you. Also, yeah, thank you for uh, right on time. <laughs> well, uh, there are many questions, but uh, still uh, some questions coming in from the audience. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, well, let me let me begin with a simple question: Why did yes. you choose Why did you choose topology as your major? You finished your uh, PhD in three, only, only in three years. Is that one reason? <laughs> well, you mean because it's, it's, it's topology is so easy that one can do it in three years. Yeah, no, I, I tell you, uh, the, the reason I did it, and, and thinking back, I've actually asked myself that question many times. And the reason is because I felt that it is the subject that has a lot to do with the way that people think. When we look at numbers, when we look at letters, for example, when humans try to recognize letters, we see that an A has a loop to it. We see that a B has two loops, and a C has no loops at all. We look, we reason in a qualitative way, and topology is the mathematics of the qualitative. So I think that is the reason that I, I, I liked it. Mm -hmm. So, okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, uh, second question is more serious from, uh, from audience, like maybe, yes. uh, maybe high school student or uh, undergraduate. Well, you know, mathematics is a difficult subject, probably uh, the most notorious yes. uh, uh, for students. So many of them, they just uh, uh, try to simple understanding, not without going into deep understanding, yes, yes, or yes. they just memorize formulas yes, and then uh, try to get uh, High score yes. in exams. Yes. Well, this is not. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, the the question. Uh, this is probably not the right way. Right. Studying mathematics for AI. So what would be your advice? Yes, I I I, I would say. Well, first of all, um, in many ways, I'm a lazy person. I don't want to have to memorize many things. If I have to memorize a hundred things, I'm going to forget them, and it's going to be a lot of work. On the other hand, if I can learn two or three principles that guide me and can and then so that I can then generate those uh, formulas or those results from those principles, I'm much happier. And so I think the time spent on learning principles from which one can generate the formulas rather than memorizing the formulas is time very well spent. And what I will say is 
we've had this discussion. I've actually uh, been involved in mathematics education in California uh, many, a number of years ago when my children were in school. And this exact discussion came up. Why should there be uh, rote learning and, and don't we need to learn to reason and so on? So it's a, it's a question that keeps coming up. But the answers are always the same. Uh, the answers are that if you have an understanding of what's going on, it's much easier for you to use the tools that you're learning. See, so, so simply memorizing formulas is, is not much help. Uh, it's not. This, no, yeah. that's right. Right. So uh, the student better to try to understand what's going on. I think it's it's, it's it's much better, and mm. it it leads you to better outcomes okay, at the yeah. end. Yes, yeah, mathematical thinking and logical thinking. Yes, uh, even computation. Okay, yes. so let me uh, move on to the second question. So you studied topology, and then you uh, you created you you found uh, IST. So yes. what was your motivation? Well, the motivation was I always uh, felt that the most exciting thing to do within, within mathematics would be to take some mathematics that has not been used before, that has not been really applied before, and to make it actually useful in the here and now. Um, you know, when people do research in mathematics, even in applied mathematics, oftentimes they will say, well, I'm, I, have, I have this range. Here's the, the very theoretical, and here's the actual application. And they will take a little step this way toward the application, and they will say, oh, now I can publish a paper because this looks like it might be applicable. I wanted to see what one could do if one takes, instead goes from here and says, well, can we use some rather simple mathematics and get some value right here? Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be the biggest theorem that I proved. It could be, you know, some more simple mathematics. And that was the idea with IASD. We saw ways of taking some rather simple mathematical constructions and using them to produce the kind of outputs that people can deal with and that deal with these complex data types. Oh, excellent. Yeah. And, uh, well, uh, you are a famous mathematician and president of ISD. So I think oh. you are the right person to answer uh, this question. Oh, yeah. well, so do you think uh, there's any uh, a distinction between pure mathematics and industrial or applied mathematics? Well, I, I think there are distinctions. I think within academia, mathematicians often pursue problems that come from a purely aesthetic point of view. Uh, that is to say, they, are, they, they come entirely from theoretical justifications, and ultimately there's no end goal, no end problem that needs solving. And so the thing that I found very refreshing at IASD and, and, and since is the fact that here there actually is an outcome that one wants at the end. And, we're going to have to maybe go through some difficult mathematics to get there, but we want to really solve a problem. Um, mm -hmm. And, of course, that's true in mathematics for many people also, but I'm just saying the, the difference is that that problem is always there on the, uh, you know, in the real world. It's not always there in academia. Okay, thank you. Uh, so you, so you, uh, you say that uh, the, the boundary between pure mathematics and applied mathematics is diminishing. Am I right? I think it should, hmm. I, I agree. I, I think hmm. it should be. I think it should diminish. I think it's a very unproductive thing to try to distinguish between pure and applied mathematics. I think all mathematics should ultimately be applicable, and it's just a matter of being hmm. clever enough to apply it. That's hmm. my view, and so I'm very much in favor of that. Excellent. Thank you for your answer. Uh, well, I got. I got a couple more uh, questions from the audience. Sure. Well, in Korea, we are not, uh, we don't have many uh, mathematicians who have been successful in creating sort of industrial uh, yes, sector. Yes. So, what would be your advice uh, or that you know, Korean well, mathematicians what uh, should pay attention to? I think the world is looking for it. I, I think. You know, we, um, uh, I, we found ourselves as, as a company being the only company to come, uh, at Stanford to come out of the mathematics department. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, so, so it's not so different in the U.S. and in Korea, in my view. Um, I think the thing is that if you, as a student of mathematics or as a faculty member or, or, or whatever, if you have some ideas 
and can think about how they just spend some time thinking about how they can apply to interesting questions in the real world, uh, you could easily uh, do something similar. And so, the, but the point is you have to be aware and think a little bit about the applied problems. You, you know, it, it, it's not that you have to focus entirely on it, but you, if, if you think about it a bit, you can start to have some ideas. Okay, thank you. Uh, so here's a more uh, 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 serious question from, from a student, I think, or maybe an yes. industrial person. Well, uh, let me quote. Uh, an audience read an article saying that uh, topological data analysis technique can be applied to medicine and material science. Mm -hmm. And could you say something more about uh, mapper technology used by ISD? Yeah. So the mapper technology is exactly, I showed you some examples of mapper um, when I showed you the breast cancer. And in fact, all those things, all the, you know, the diabetes, um, uh, the malaria, the progression of disease, the cancer, the gut biome, all those things were mapper analyses. And the mapper thing is simply what allows you to take data sets and produce from it something you could call the shape of the data. So, um, you, you know, and it doesn't insist that it's lie along a line or that it break into pieces. Uh, so, um, you, you know, that's what the mapper technology does. And, uh, you know, in, in, in my view, it's, uh, I think there's lots that can be done to improve it. There's a lot of research going on around the stability of it and so on within the topological data analysis community. And I think that's a, that's a great thing. We ought to understand more precisely what it does and, and, and develop better tools for it. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so let me uh, move on to second question, uh, next question. Yep. Well, this is uh, also maybe coming from a student or general audience. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the difference between topology and geometry? Well, uh, I, I already explained there. briefly uh, in Korean uh, at the introduction. So, but could you yeah, add? Yeah. Okay. Sh shall I go ahead? Or? I mean, could you add uh, some uh, uh, more your comment on on this uh, distinction between topology and geometry? Yeah, you would like me to? Yes, I will. So I will explain. Yeah. So I think this is, a, this is a very interesting point because there's actually a continuum between topology, which is somewhat discrete, and geometry, which is thought of as very rigid. But there's all sorts of areas in between. And topological analysis, data analysis, often has some scale components to it and so on that actually put it somewhere in between. Because, you know, topology, one always passes to the limit. One says that things are connected um, if they are, if, you know, one, one, one tries to define what it means to be infinitely close. And of course, nothing in the real world is ever infinite. And so uh, there have to be elements of scale involved. Uh, and so, yes, topological data analysis is on that spectrum. And I think that's where we have to be playing. All are interesting. And the spectrum between, uh, between geometry and topology is what's really interesting at producing these uh, uh, different ways to look at data. Okay, I think uh, that's uh, more than enough. And okay. uh, <clears throat> yeah, final, yeah, there's yeah, also final question. Huh? Well, uh, this is more like a, a question on topology. Yeah. Well, the question is that, uh, you know, that uh, genus one torus, similar to bagel and two yes. hole pretzel, this I mean, practical real things can be explained by topology. Two-dimensional topology and with with holes and then genus. I mean, yes, yes, yes. Could you, yeah, could you some uh, comment on that? Oh yes. Yeah. So um, you know, something we did not talk about is the notion of persistent homology. So homology is what captures this notion of holes and components and so forth. It's a very interesting thing, and and this idea of homology, which was defined in the latter part of the nineteenth century. Um, you know, really allows you to make very quantitative the notion of how many holes are there. You know, if we think about that problem, it feels very much like, well, you, some human has to look at it and sees there are three holes and somebody else looks at it and thinks there's only two holes, whatever. Hmm. But in fact, there's a very precise mathematical meaning to it. And that level of precision 
is very important in producing results. So we've actually used two-dimensional things to find structures that uh, affect image processing, that allow you to do texture recognition, and in fact allow you to make deep learning work better on images. Uh, just from understanding that there's a certain space, there's a Klein bottle that uh, is uh, present in uh, the data coming out from, uh, from uh, uh, image processing. Okay, so uh, uh, I told you I'm a geometer, doing yep. alge algebraic geometry. Yep. Well, so in your data analysis, the which level of topology used? So yeah. very high tech topology like homotopy theory and even this kind of thing uh, the students should learn. Well, as you would expect, um, the first thing applications are of things that are very simple. And those take you a long way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, very simple first, uh, you know, homology H1 and H2 and, and, and so on. And then this mapper construction, which is also a very simple part of a topology, is what gets used first. But what we're finding now is that over time, we're going to introduce more and more of it. So homotopy theory can be applied to understand so-called evasion problems. So when you have a collection, so-called sensor net of moving sensors, you can ask, when can an evader avoid all those sensors and never get detected? Uh, and that is a very interesting problem in homotopy theory, it turns out, and one has to solve it as such. So uh, we're going to find over time that the more sophisticated parts of the subject are going to get applied. But of course, the, big, the early wins, the early uh, you, you know, things that one does, we are going to use the simpler parts of the subject. I see. So, uh, well, uh, so... Well, many of them are, may encounter difficult situations that where kind of standard modeling doesn't fit in many, many, many situations. So, yes. so necessary ability should be a mathematical thinking, not I just memorizing formulas and theorems. So mathematics Absolutely. is not, yeah, not a subject of memory. Not only that, not only that it's so much more fun. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Uh, could you give, me, uh, give us a final uh, comment? Final comment is, I, you know, I hope, uh, you know, many of you in the audience are young people, and I hope that you will take uh, the idea that all of mathematics should be applied. I, that's the kind of the main thing I want to see. I want to see the most exciting thing to me is application of a new area of mathematics in a serious way to solve a real problem. If you can do that, you will have... Uh, you have succeeded greatly. Okay, thank you. It's time to wrap up. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for your wonderful lecture and sharing time and yes. experience with us. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much. Hope to see you. you. Hope to see you uh, in the near future in, uh, in in Seoul. I hope so too. I would love to come. Okay. Thank bye you. Bye. 네, 서울에서 다시 뵙기를 또 기대하면서 두 번째 기조 강연 이렇게 마무리하도록 하겠습니다. 군나 칼슨 ISD 창업자님과 함께 금종회 대한수학 회장님께서 좌장으로 수고를 해주셨습니다.